Well, the new normal is never a destination. It's a plateau for growth. It's like the Olympic model, sitius, altius, fortius, swifter, higher, stronger. Those words are not written in the superlative of the word. It's not swiftest, highest, or strongest. It's with an ER stem bending, meaning we can be the swiftest today, but swifter tomorrow. Someone cares about you. There's a reason why your heart is beating. You still have a purpose. Don't give up. It's important to know that you're not alone. You're not alone. You're, you're not, not alone. alone. You are not alone. We have an incredible guest this episode, John Register. John's a two-time Paralympian, a Persian Gulf War Army veteran, and despite losing his left leg during training for the 1996 Olympic Games, he never lost his fighting spirit. He now uses his experiences to inspire people to live healthier, wealthier, and more fulfilling lives. John, welcome to the One Mile, One Veteran podcast. Hey, Danny, so excited to be on your show. Thanks for inviting me and can't wait to get this conversation started for your audience. Absolutely. I want to learn a little bit more about your background before we dive into the work that you do and the, and the subjects that you speak on. Uh, so by the time you joined the military, you were already an accomplished collegiate athlete and graduate. Why did you decide to go enlisted into the Army? <laughs> That's a great question. You, you go right to the, right to the juggler, right? <laughs> <laughs> we're all running from something or running to something, brother, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, I, I joined for two very specific reasons. The first was my wife and I were pregnant with our son, who was going to be born on December 1st, and I didn't have a job. So I needed to get someone to pay for this kid. Uh, <laughs> so that, that was one. <laughs> the second, I mean, uh, was I, I, continue, I wanted to continue to run track and field. And I, it wasn't out of my system. I had gone to the Olympic trials in 1988 after graduating from the University of Arkansas. Go Pigs. Uh, but I, I, it wasn't out of my system. And I didn't want to go work for an entry-level position that I had at a local uh, television station that was going to be there. And so I decided to, as I was walking to the mall, I saw a flyer. Uh, that said there's an Army world-class athlete program, which allows a soldier athlete to train for two years prior to the next Olympic Games. If you could just be um, uh, validated by your national governing body of sport or NGB. So I decided that was for me. I wanted to do this program. And uh, there was no guarantees I was going to be a member. I would have to go through basic training, uh, advanced individual training. And then hopefully I could be released from my unit to go do this program and all army sports, which I was just about to find out a lot about. So those are the two basic reasons why I joined the military. That's incredible. You found a way to continue your collegiate dream and still provide for your family. And I, I wish like as many people were as resourceful as you, but as you were preparing to go to California and participate in the Army's world-class athlete program to pursue a spot on the Olympic team in track and field, you actually received orders to deploy in support of Operation Desert Shield. What was that experience like for you? Oh, that's loaded too. Um, so, yeah. So after AIT, there was like three days I had to transfer to the Army's um, all army track and field camp. And I did that camp and I couldn't believe it. So I got out there and I was selected for the world-class athlete program team. A lot of came from my national governing body of sport, USA track and field. So I was also loving army life. This was the greatest thing since sliced bread, man. It was, it was awesome. And I, I got, I got it hook, line and sinker as I walked across the parade field at Fort Jackson, South Carolina. Uh, after the, all the basic training that we had gone through, you know, eyes right, we're saluting the, the, the press box that's up there. Um, and I began thinking about all the people that were, that had walked this parade field before I did, that pr protected Americans, not, not so much freedoms, because I, I think that we get that wrong. It was protecting the United States Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and that I was going to bear true faith and allegiance to the same, because that is my oath. Um, so after... We did that. I, I understood it at a very visceral level, and I wanted to be a lifer. So I took the Army Selection Officer battery test as well, passed it, kept that in my back pocket. And as I was going through my leadership course at uh, Fort Dix, New Jersey, to try to make rank, uh, I was called off to Operation Desert Shield, Desert Storm. Now, I was a three-time winner or a three-time loser, depending on how you want to look at it. <laughs> I, I was in school. And Command Sergeant Major of the Army at that time said that if you're in school, you're non-deployable. I was also a loss to my unit. 
I was about to head to Presidio, San Francisco to do uh, my world-class athlete program thing. And third, I was working a job in my MOS, my military occupational specialty, uh, at Fort Dix that was designed for two E-4s. And we were excess because we had multiple E-5s working in those positions. So they were the excess. But because I was in school and didn't have a vote, I'm the one that got selected. <laughs> How does that happen? <laughs> so I was diverted from my orders to going to Presidio to Operation Desert Storm. But here's how I think about things, uh, Danny. It's 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 what I was, te- number one, I was terrified, right? Because I, I, I spoke to myself and I said, if I come back, and that just freaked me out, right, to nobody's business. So I started bawling, started crying, if I come back. And then I remembered that I had a, a prayer that I had asked for. I wanted, I wanted, I wanted uh, to see my fruit, uh, and the fruit of what I bear in life. And uh, and I got a calm over me when I was kind of in prayer and they said, well, you want to see your fruit. I'm sending you to Operation Desert Shield Desert Storm to see your fruit. And this peace came over me because I realized I was coming back <laughs> from theater. So I got myself a book, a little kitabi, which is an Arabic for book. Uh, the eye and the end the eye and the end of the kitabi makes it possessive for my book. So kitabi. I started learning a little bit of Arabic. I would learn the numbers, wahad, tanin, talata, arba, kamsa. So I would learn the, the, how to count to 10. I would learn the local um, sayings of, of, the, the, uh, of, uh, of, of the Muslim community, right? So, salam alaikum, wa alaikum salam, kebhalak, kwis, uh, sadigi. All these kind of words I began putting into my vernacular. So I began trying to understand the surroundings that I was in. And so I had a, a great time over there, even though we were under much duress. So I gave my, my mind an outlet. And I think that's sometimes what we have to do. When we come under times of duress and stress, what are the outlets that are available to us to learn a little bit more about the environment that we're going to so that we can have the best experience possible? That's really great that you learned how to start to manage your fear. Did did your change in mentality start to rub off on those around you? Uh, because war wasn't necessarily something that was imminent during the early 90s that a lot of the army was going off to. And then all of a sudden, a, a large scale conflict did kick, uh, did kick off. Yes, yeah, so it it did. Uh, I'm a I'm a person of uh, deep faith and in, in, in Christianity, and, and so when it got over there to Operation Desert Shield Desert Storm, uh, I started this kind of prayer group, and we had this 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 meeting house in the middle of our camp in the middle of the desert in a Muslim country. It was really remarkable, uh, and so we would have these services every night. And I will tell you, I will attest, there are no atheists in a foxhole. <laughs> that church was packed every night. <laughs> Uh, it was amazing how that happened. And so, uh, so you asked the question around who kind of came and, and then who I would, I would also say who kind of pushed away from that, uh, aspect of it because of my, uh, not forcefulness, but just because of the confidence that I was exuding during this time, because I really wasn't afraid to, to quote unquote die. Right. Because I had this other thing that was going on in my, in my headspace. So there were those that gravitated towards this um, uh, this identity I was displaying. And there were those that were repelling it. I, I got it, for example, I'll show you. The one that repelled um, wanted to get rid of me. So they sent me to Dahran uh, to do seven uh, eight on, eight off guard duty for a month, right? Uh, so I went down to Dahran, but remember I was learning Arabic. So I was on guard with, in the same compound, Saudi Arabia National Guard complex. And I would serve with these amazing soldiers from Saudi Arabia. And I would practice my Arabic with them. And they were they were freaking out because I was this American learning Arabic, right? And, uh, and then one day, a car pulled up. I didn't recognize the car. And everybody started moving around and jumping to attention and all this other stuff. And I'm like, you know, hand on my, <laughs> my weapon because I don't know what's about to pop off. <laughs> <laughs> and it turns out it's it's a Saudi prince. So glad didn't, I didn't take my weapon out. <laughs> and he lines up, everybody lines up and he's going down the list, kind of shaking everybody's hand and, you know, giving them, you know, double kiss and everything. And he gets to me. So I lined up too, right? So I'm not supposed to, but I, I, I just put myself in the, in the mix. <laughs> and he comes to me, he says, oh, and he says, uh, 
he, he's, he's puzzled. So I say to him, Salam Alaikum. He's like, oh, Walaikum Salam. And I say, uh, how are you? He's like, ah, oh, quiz, quiz, I'm good. And then I'd say, there were some other words I knew. I don't remember anymore. Um, but after about like seven or eight of the exchanges, because I was out after that, it had nothing else. <laughs> he, <laughs> he was, he switched to English and we had this like 10 minute conversation with, I'm talking to the Saudi prince for like 10 minutes and he's asking me all these different questions and, you know, and uh, that were all about myself, my family and, and, and after he, he, you know, gave me the, the hug and kind of the double kiss thing and, and, um, and off he went, those Saudis in their book, I could do no wrong. They took me under their wing. They had me come out for tea. They had me come out to, to their meals. And even though I couldn't speak the language, it was the language of friendship. And that it was, it was a language of an understanding that we are more closely related than, than we are apart, which was opposed and opposite of what my parents were telling me through letters that were coming back from the United States. I was having a very different experience than what they were experiencing of what was being told to them. So that was my first lesson. And usually what's going on on the battlefield is not getting reported accurately back at, at home. So we have to watch what we uh, who we listen to. Absolutely. I mean, that's... That's absolutely amazing. First, the fact that you started a prayer group when you got over there. Um, spiritual health is is such a foundational part of a person's life uh, in order to have a good, well-rounding and of the Christian faith, you know, learning Arabic to gain a further understanding of the people. That's how we first show love to other people is that we come to empathize and understand who they are, regardless of how little bit that is. Uh, I understand learning only just a few a few phrases to, to at least show that you're taking a vested interest. Now, the service over in Iraq and the Persian Gulf had ended, uh, came to a close. You're back in the States, still in the Army. 1994, you're preparing for a potential spot on the Olympic team, running the hurdles, and you suffered a horrific training accident that led to your leg amputation. Yeah. So you go back a little bit, you know, right after the war, I, I made it out to Presidio San Francisco and did get on the world-class athlete program. And I was so out of shape because of the six months as a high hurdler and because you need a, it's a rhythm event. Um, I just could not run the high hurdles as I did prior to leaving. So I switched events to the 400 meter hurdles, which is a longer event. It's one time around the track over 10 obstacles spaced 35 meters apart. And after my fifth race, I qualified for the Olympic trials. In my sixth race, I, um, I finished up 17th out of about 54 athletes in those trials in 1992 down in New Orleans. So I said, I'm going to re-up and I'm going to do another four years, try to get this world-class athlete program thing done again. And, uh, I think I can make the team, the United States Olympic team for the 1996 Olympic Games. I still have my officer candidate uh, packet in my, in, the, in my pocket. Uh, so I went to Germany, uh, Bitburg, Germany, matter of fact. And when I came back uh, after Bitburg, that was when I was, I was out there in 1994. And when I came back for all army track and field camp, uh, I was running the hurdles. And in that training session, I misstepped a hurdle. I dislocated my left knee. I severed the artery behind my kneecap. And seven days later, I became an amputee. Mm. So in one misstep, right? And how many missteps do we all have in life? Out of one misstep, I not only ended my athletic career, I also ended my military career and going to become an officer uh, in, the, in the United States Army. So I had my whole road, you know, life road planned ahead and now it was diverted, it was shifted, it was changed. And I started going quickly, you know, not so much down the downward spiral, but my thoughts patterns were different. Um, I was trying to think about, you know, it may have been, who am I now? Um, what, what's my identity? Is, is my wife going to stay with me? Is, is my son still going to see me as his father? Do I still have a job in the military? Can I support my family? I mean, my Olympic dreams are gone. OCS is gone. And it was at that lowest moment that my wife, Alice, saw me struggling. She wrapped her arms around me. She said, what are you, what's going on in your head? And I began to articulate those things back to her. And then she said the words that really stopped my downward spiral. She said, you know what, John, we're going to get through this together. It's, it's just our new normal. 
And it was with those words that she really baselined my entire existence. So I began retooling and re kind of purposing. And I got out of the military. I started working for the Army's world-class athlete program as a civilian. Uh, and I started swimming for physical therapy. Lo and behold, there was a parallel path that revealed itself called the Paralympic Games. Paralympic Games, I thought, were Special Olympics, which is for cognitive disabilities. These games are the parallel games to the Olympics. They're for athletes with physical disabilities and visual impairment. And so as I swam, I never thought I would make a team, but it gave me a target. And from team to target, I actually somehow fluked up, got so fast in the water that I made the Paralympic swim team and went to Atlanta anyway, not as a 400-meter hurdler, but as a 100-meter freestyler. (laughs) <laughs> so, who knew who knew I could swim <laughs> so, uh, I saw athletes on the track running with artificial limbs I had a leg made for running and then four years later I won the silver medal in the long jump in Sydney Australia returning back to the track also finished fifth in the 100 meters and the 200 meter dashes as well so that's kind of the athletic career right it, it kind of you can you can build a parallel path I mean, I'm sure that you know, you know, as we're talking, you know, with a one mile, one veteran, um, we we build parallel paths. You know, one path diverts or maybe the train goes off on this siding over here, but we can get back on the main the main uh, track again when we get some time to rest and recover. Absolutely. I mean, that encouragement from your wife and the support from your loved ones as as you're going forward can really help change the dire- trajectory of where we're heading. And I know uh, in your most recent book that you released uh, back in 2020, you help people journal and kind of find their stories. You mentioned something about false peaks and going along this path towards a goal. Would you mind being able to kind of explain how, you know, the the training that you were doing to qualify for the Olympic Games just – happened to be reframed as a false peak on your way to the road of what your purpose became. Right. I think once we we make it, you know, then that story I'm talking about, I think I'm talking about uh, climbing up um, Pike's Peak. Well, there's a there's a Manitou Springs incline and you're almost at the top. You think you're at the top and then you, you, you've done this huge workout. I mean, you're up to almost a mile in. And then there is, you look up and you see you got to still a little more to go, right? You're like, oh, crap, man, I got <laughs> I to go some more. And then when you get to the top, there is a valley on the other side. And so you get to this false summit and you, you know you have more to go, but then you get to the top and you realize you have to go down the valley again to get to the next highest summit. And so how much, how do we expend our energy during that time? Uh, so those are the things I, I think about as we are building at uh, our uh, the, the things that we want to accomplish uh, in life. And so as we are uh, climbing up those the, the side of the mountain, you know we know that mountains go up and down, and so there's going to be a valley moment that's coming. So we can anticipate that, and we can have our reserves and make sure we have enough water. We got to, our, our pack is is. Has is uh, has the, the correct things in it. What if the weather changes? Do I have a tent? Do I have cover? All those things we can think about as we're climbing up the side of the mountain, even as though it's getting hard. And then we can rest at the top. We can take it in. We can see the beauty that's around us uh, before we start off on the, the next the next peak. I love that example and the illustrations that you provide in there from your personal life as well as things that you've witnessed or experienced. Why did you decide to start sharing your experiences and these stories with others? I think I came from, uh, I've always shared, uh, but I, I think more, I would say, the context of doing it in this context of professional speaker really came from doing TEAR missions, Total Army Involvement and Recruiting. And I would go, one of my jobs in the Army's World Class Athlete Program as a civilian was to make sure that our athletes had some type of uh, job that they could do inside of the inside of the, the the world class athlete program. So I would take these athletes on these terror missions, total army involvement recruiting. We go to high schools to try to get troops and boots. And at, we, me with my artificial leg, I would tell a funny story. You know, uh, I know what you're thinking. My favorite restaurants, I hop, I got it, uh, right. So I would tell these funny little quips and things, or, t- or tell a poem that made a point. Uh, and the athletes would then talk, tell their story afterwards. Well, when I got back to Virginia, where I was living at the time, 
the recruiters started calling me and saying that the principals were calling them, asking who was the one-legged guy that was down there talking to their students because they were still talking about me. And they asked if I could come back down and have like a 35-minute conversation with them about life and how life changes and how we, we have challenges and we can overcome those challenges. And that became, uh, I said, yes, I would go, I would do it. But then they asked the magic question. They said, well, how much do you charge for that? And I said, I'll get back to you in a moment. <laughs> and I began trying to understand that there, this, you, I didn't know you could get paid to, to do this and paid to speak. So that kind of began the, the first uh, iteration of me becoming a professional speaker and wanting to share the story. And I, I've learned a lot of things along the way that trying to help others in their story journeys as as well. And I, I coach it uh, also. Now, I'm, I'm just a coach. I'm just one of a lot of coaches that are out there. But, you know, I, people tend to, some, some people like to hear my voice. Some people like to hear somebody else's voice. That's all. And so that's how I look at it. So we do it online. And, we, you know, if, you, if you're you know, interested, we, we, we try to do that. But what, what came out from it, uh, Danny, is a contextual model of how I processed the information when I said that Alice told me it's just our new normal. So I've been using that coinage of that term for about, no, oh, since she told me that back in 1994. And now people are jaded with the term, the new normal, because it's been overused during the pandemic. But just because something's overused doesn't mean we should discard it. So I help people to understand other things that are in their life that might be overused, but are still of value. Uh, so most people, a lot of people I heard that when they were saying the new normal were saying, uh, I, I just wish things would get back to the way it used to be. I wish I, I just want to go things to go back to normal. Well, that's not happening. So that's why they're they're jaded against it, right? Or they, it came out this way. Guess this is just our new normal. And so there was no forward progress. There was no way that we could advance on the new normal with this type of mindset. But if we break the two words down, new and normal, new actually means no prior point of reference. So if new is no prior point of reference, we can't use old systems, old thoughts, old ideas to put into a new bucket to get a different output. Secondarily, the normal is the everyday typical occurrence of a thought or an action. So we still need a new ritual that leads us to a rhythm, the rhythm that elevates us to a rise and the rise that creates the desired result that we're looking for. The challenge is that when we, have, when we shift into a new environment, we have to take our atmosphere with us to that new environment or else we panic in that new environment because we don't have enough oxygen. And we do, and panicking, you know, whatever, makes us do kind of crazy stuff. Like in the pandemic, we all went out because we're panicked. We didn't know what to do. We bought toilet paper because <laughs> that was going to solve COVID. It just, we, don't, we do irrational things. And so we have to know that in the new, we do need this new system. We had to, we had to buy things different. And some of those things have stuck. A lot of people are still buying things like on Amazon or or we go to the, the movie theater now and we order our, 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 our popcorn on our phones or we go to the restaurant and we get the QR code, right? So those things have still, we, we have a new way of doing those things. So the new normal is never a destination. It's a plateau for growth. It's a growth mindset model. It's like the Olympic model, Sitius, Altius, Fortius, Swifter, Higher, Stronger. Those words are not written in the superlative of the word. It's not swiftest, highest or strongest. It's with an ER stem bending, meaning we can be the swiftest today, but swifter tomorrow. So we all have to look for our ER stem bendings in our life to, to make us advance. So when we hit that mountaintop, it's not a place of destination. It's another valley, another peak to, a peak to grow for, grow to. That's a wonderful way to frame or reframe this new normalcy. Uh, it's it's not a going back to the way things were. It's not a resignation to, I guess that's just the way things are. Or one of the phrases that used to irk me uh, years ago was, it is what it is, especially the way that would be said. And so to be able to navigate and really see what's being presented in front of us to be able to move forward. But for some of those, for some of us, we have difficulty addressing adjusting to new environments. So how would you suggest that people um, 
especially veterans that, that have a lot of anxiety coming out of service for whatever reason, or somebody that suffered a traumatic event as a child or, or um, a young person, their reality is, is that they can get hurt when they try new things. And so they build an environment, encapsulate themselves in this environment of safety. So how do they bring that safe environment into new experiences? Great question. Um, here's a way to think about this. And there are, there are many ways to think about it, but I'm going to give you a way. The first is, I believe, we have to have a reckoning moment. The reckoning moment is realizing things do not go back to the way they used to be. That's the first hurdle. People get caught in that loop. Man, I just wish things would go back to the way it used to be. Because we have a false sense of nostalgia that is associated with the way it used to be, right? Once we get out of that loop and we hurdle that uh, reckoning, now we're into the revision. And the revision is hurdled once we commit to the new vision that we know we have to commit to. We know we have to do it. We come to the vision of it. We have to commit. But there are three things that hold us back from committing. The first are other people. Other people in our life, usually closest to us, that believe for us what we can or cannot do, which is based upon what they believe they could or could not do if they were in our situation. When I was building out the Paralympic military sport program, a um, lot of soldiers wanted to get back into the fight. A lot of soldiers wanted to do the activities. But because they were injured and they had a family member with them, the family member said, oh, maybe you don't want to, maybe you want to be a little care- cautious and careful. So it, it would hold the service member back from advancing forward to what the vision that they knew they needed to do, right? Not ill-intended intentions. It's just that I'm a little fearful for you, so maybe, maybe be a little more reserved, right? Uh, secondarily, it's, uh, society, we have to hurdle, you know, we have to, the other thing that holds us back is society. Society puts some dictates and presses upon us, normalizations that we all adhere to, some rules, so to speak. And I'm an amputee. Captain Hook's an amputee. He's an above the wrist amputee. He's scaring the lost boys in the movie Peter Pan. He's got a funny looking mustache and he got his arm bit up by TikTok the crocodile. He wears a hook. So we're afraid of this claw guy. He's the villain. But wait a minute. He's an amputee. I'm an amputee. Am I, am I a villain? Is that how Disney portrays me as an amputee? A villain? What about every Halloween when we see Freddy Krueger burned over all over his body, scaring the, the children in their dreams? Is that how we treat our military veterans who, who were burned over 90% of their bodies and survived? And are now been at Brook Army Medical Center and scrubbed down and, and going back out in society. They're, they're across from their children. Is that what we're telling them about society? And they believe that you're now the nightmare in your children's dreams? And we bought our ticket to the dance? Thank you for your service. Right? And then finally, I have to be the one who jumps. I've had some of the best hurdle coaches in my life in, in, in the world. And none of them ever ran over a hurdle for me. I'm the one that has to actually attack the hurdle. And once I attack that revision, that commitment, I'm now in the hardest part of the model. And that's the renewal. And the renewal begins with a rebirth. Remember, we talked about new. New is no prior point of reference. So when we're in the rebirth, we can't go back to old ways. It's an impossibility. It's like, <laughs> it's like the old joke. Uh, with bacon and eggs, right? How does your bacon and eggs come? Well, the the hen was uh, involved in the process. The chick, the the chicken was involved in the process. The pig was committed. <laughs> you, can't, you can't go back to the way it was, and that's the difference between the reckoning moment and the and hurtling into the revision of the renewal. Because in the in the reckoning, you can go back. You can kind of get stuck in that loop. And the and the we have forgotten what the word commitment actually means. You cannot go back to the way it was. That's a mindset total shift or something physical like my leg being amputated. That's a total commitment, sold out. And I I harp on that. I emphasize that because I want that to be drilled into the difference of of just, you know, wishy-washy and committing to something. And once we commit, we go off in that direction. But we do have phantom pains that bring us back to sometimes that uh, revision. 
I get phantom pains. But in my commitment, I and where all things are new, I had to learn how to not only manipulate a wheelchair to a prosthetic appointment, learn how to put on an artificial leg, that's new. Learn how to walk between the parallel bars to get my balance, that's new. Learn how to walk on a four-bar walker around the hospital, that's new. Four-bar walker to crutches, crutches to cane, cane to free walking, free walking to running, running to jumping, jumping to a medal at the Paralympic Games. That process took seven years, and we want it now. It needs to incubate. So in the new, in the, re, in the rebirth, we need space and grace to grow. Can we offer that to ourselves? Can we offer that to others when something's new, a new project, a new program comes out? People need time to accept it, think about it, learn it, and then actuate upon it and learn how to do it. And that, that process takes time. But we want a Burger King and McDonald's. We want it right now. Once we've gotten there, now that's the resolve. I've done the work. I'm resolved in who I am. I know exactly how I'm showing up. I know exactly how I'm walking now. And that re resolution is I'm never going back to the way it used to be. No, you need to catch up to where I am. And that equals our the last hurdle, which we fly over, and that's the reward. So we give ourselves a reward for kind of going through the entire process. But remember, the reward, like in our mountain analogy, it's not a destination. It's a plateau for growth. Why? Because I can be at the renewal in one area of my life, and I can be at the, the reckoning moment in another area of my life. I can be at the rebirth in another area of my life, and I can be at uh, the, about to commit in the revision in another area. So I can be all over in different areas, and it's all layered. Plus, I can see where somebody else might be based upon what their language is. If they're saying they always want things to go back to normal, they're in the, re they're in the reckoning moment. So that so we probably know where they are. If they're about to say, "Yeah, I just I'm about to make this commitment," I don't know if, uh, somebody, some, but my my wife's holding me back, my 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 husband's holding me back. They're probably right at the revision, right? So we can see where we are based upon that little contextual model. That's absolutely powerful. Thank you for breaking it down like that. I mean, it it seems like so many people struggle with the committing part, and then pass up these opportunities to to build new memories, experience new things, even with loved ones, because it seems so much easier to say, no, I can't do that, or no, I'm, I'm no longer made to do that. So how do you find the motivation to say yes when it seems nearly impossible to achieve what that goal is? Yeah, I, I think you got to put some habits in place. I'm reading a book right now, Atomic Habits, and um, I think putting some habits together are are really good to kind of push you out of the funk and just get going. One habit you know I like to do is serving others. So if I get myself serving others, then I'm out of my funk and I'm focusing on someone else, right? I can redirect my attention. Another habit I have is like this morning, I was, I was had a major presentation this morning. I wasn't feeling it. Um, so I went for a swim. So I like to do act, 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 activities, exercise. I also have a habit of, you know, reading scripture in the morning. I have a habit of listening to it as well. Um, and so I, I try to get those things ingrained in me so that it's no matter what I'm doing, I can kind of point back and say, did I miss something today to that ties that habit? Um, and then I let myself reflect. So, for example, I'm I have not accepted the death of my mother. She passed away almost two years ago now, and I'm still struggling with that. So I have to go through the same process as well, right? It's not that I'm I'm always at the at the um, at the mountaintop. It's not that I'm always uh, at in the in the resolve. S sometimes it's even though I know that she's gone, I fully haven't committed to it, and I know this talking to you right now, haven't fully committed, and I'm still in this this whole wish the way it would go back to the way it used to be cycle, and I know that I can say it. But I have to, but but part of it is recognizing that I'm, I'm in that spot and then I can I can work with somebody to help me get through the next phases. Mm, that's that's really powerful to to be that vulnerable to say, like, I'm not always at the top of the mountain and this is where I'm at right now. So thank you for sharing. I, I you know. My prayers go out to you and your family as as you continue to, you know, navigate the loss of your of your mother. Um, you know, one of the things uh, 
<laughs> one of our favorite quotes from Atomic Habits is, you don't rise to the level of your goals, you fall to the level of your systems. And, right, yeah. you know, this, this year has been personally life-changing for me. While we were traveling in Europe, I was, uh, w- when, we, when we left Hawaii to, to do an extended time of travel, I left all of my old systems behind and I didn't develop new ones right away. Um, you know, my community was no longer there. So my, my fitness buddies were no longer there. Um, and when I found myself in Europe, I found myself falling back into depression because I didn't have those systems in place because they, they there weren't any. But starting to develop that morning routine of silence, of breathing, of light movement, of scripture reading, good listening, even if it's only five minutes, really changes the trajectory. And we can end up finding out, I found out, like I can accomplish a lot more in my day knowing that I've just faced those basic building blocks of, of my daily structure. Absolutely. Absolutely. So yeah, I love that, I love that quote too. I've, I've highlighted that like 18 times. <laughs> you fall to love my system. I don't have any system, man. <laughs> Give me a system. Well, well, John, your, your story is so incredible. Um, I, I want to read more about you. I want to learn more about you. Uh, the lessons that you pass on to your listeners in this conversation was just like scratching the surface, uh, surface of these workshops that you hold and the content that you put out on your social media. So if people want to follow or even connect with you, where can they find more information? Oh, thanks. Yeah, yeah. The most of it is right on my website, johnregister.com. Uh, so there's l- multiple ways to connect with me there. I'm all over social media. Primarily do most of my work on LinkedIn and Instagram. Uh, tr- I'm, I am trying to get my Instagram followers up. So <laughs> hit me on the IG at John F. Register, that's for sure. Um, and you know the book that you are referring to, uh, 10 Power Stories to Impact Any Leader, Journal Your Way to Leadership Success. It's not on Amazon. You're not going to find it there. I mean, you can get a PDF version of it if you want to, I guess, on Kindle. But um, I, I did not write it as a book for myself. Uh, it's It has nothing to do with my story whatsoever. It really was written uh, at the beginning of the pandemic to help our ambassadors find a story that they could share as the pandemic was looming and actually had come to some of their country's doorstep. Uh, and they had to navigate between, because half, uh, I'll go back, half of our ambassadors are career people and half of our ambassadors are appointees by the current administration. So you can imagine what's going on with this cross mix. And I was, uh, 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 Secretary Pompeo at the time had asked me to come in, invited me to come in to do a, a keynote address around managing change. But we were actually in the process of this, this amalgamated change and I changed the entire presentation like 15 minutes before I went on. Because I saw it was not, not, I won't say chaos in the room, but there was a lot of fear. You know, how do I, how do I say the, what the current administration is wanting me to say when I see death at my doorstep in my country and they're about to kick me out, right? How do I, how do I lead in that? So it's not about a political agenda. It's about how do I lead when I have different talking points and I see factually what's coming before me. That is a very tough place. And so I say, you got to do with this a story. And that's why I wrote that book, 10 Power Stories to Impact the Leader. Uh, so yeah, anybody can journal their way to leadership success through it. It's a, it's a great book. Uh, I just picked it up recently. And the read through the stories, it, it, it's almost like having um, a daily study. Uh, and and I actually I, I absolutely appreciated that not just the stories that you tell but the reflection that it brings about uh, even for personal growth. So even if you're not looking to to lead an organization, but you're looking to inspire yourself to to a better way forward, uh, I would definitely suggest picking it up and and doing a daily study of it. It's it's a pretty it's a you know it's it's an easy read. It's not it's not like a the a hard into in the weeds like study. It's there, it's a it's a fun little book, and I have my favorite two are the church, the creek, and the kid. I love that one with my son, and you know, and so we talked about identity, right? And so one of my identity struggles was uh, my son after church would say, "Hey, Dad, can we race down to the creek?" And uh, after I was, you know, of course, yeah, we we raced down, we walked back and talked. 
But after that, um, I lost my leg and had my leg amputated. I couldn't do it. I, my leg was sore. It was hurting. And this kid comes up after church and says, hey, Dak, we raced down the creek again. And I said, I mean, it was, it was painful. <laughs> uh, I, I just can't do that right now, son. And then he, you know, he looks up at me, he looks down at my leg, looks back up at me, looks down at my leg and looks back up at me and says, well, can, can we just walk down there? And then it's, it's that most like powerful, the six-year-old kids telling me, dad, it's not about the race. It's about the relationship. Oh, killer. I mean, those things, can we pay attention to the six-year-old kids that are around us? And, you know, I, I, I know that's one of my favorites in there. So. <laughs> it's, it's absolutely beautiful. Well, I know that for many veterans, life after service, this transition has many challenges and can overwhelm a lot. And unfortunately, many of them never reach their new normal and die by suicide. Is there anything that you would like to say to someone who's experiencing crisis in their life to spread hope to them? Yeah, you know, thanks. The you know how when you get in a, a foxhole and your hair starts standing up because you know something about to pop off. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> it's about to get froggy. Uh, we have those signs in our own lives that are like the hair standing up. And we we can't avoid that prompt that's coming. So when that time comes and you know that you need to reach out and call for that help, do it. Pick up the phone. Because we're not going to give in to the enemy that says that your life is not valuable. No, your life is valuable. It's, it's more valuable than, than you can even think. The people that you have impacted already in your life, uh, they want more and more of you. So just know that you're out there and you're loved, uh, you're supported, uh, and we got your six. It's wonderfully said, John. Thank you so much for joining us here on the One Mile, One Veteran podcast. Thanks, Danny.